<clears throat> Ready to go. All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, um, to our monthly webinar. Thanks for uh, being here. Um, it's hosted by Nexus Commercial Realty, uh, multifamily brokerage and land development brokerage. Um, hopefully, everybody gets some good value out of this. I'm excited for the topic today of is it a good time to buy or sell? Obviously, people have different needs and thoughts on when, uh, when it's a good time to buy or sell. And we have two speakers today that are kind of doing a little bit of both. So I thought there would be some good um, questions and some synergies here to um, have them speak. And um, obviously, we always have the chat, chat function open for questions. So please feel free as we're going along here to um, ask questions. Um, I'll give an opportunity here for each one of them to just do a little intro on themselves and um, we'll go from there. Greg, you want to start us? Sure. Well, Adam, I'm first off, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to see if I can't get the invite to the Canada ski trip now. Now that I'm on your webinar. <laughs> anyway, so uh, just kidding. So uh, I grew up here in Denver, uh, went to East High School and then Boston University and uh, came back. Um, promptly after graduating and joined a group in town called Forum Real Estate Group. Uh, I was at Forum for about seven and a half years. I'm sure many of you know of Forum uh, and uh, was extremely grateful and lucky candidly to be a part of it. I think we had bought about $2 billion worth of real estate in that period of time, which was predominantly uh, multifamily. Uh, in the last several years I was there, I was running the uh, acquisition group and uh, within that subset of the company, we had bought about 9,000 units uh, and then at any given time was asset managing six to 12 deals or so. Um, and then two years ago, started uh, Highlands Vista Group and we've subsequently uh, with this uh, new venture bought about 1,500 units and have assets under management of about 175 million. Uh, we look for cash flowing real estate, uh, which is uh, hard not to laugh when you say it. It's somewhat of an oxymoron these days, uh, but are, are really conservative investors uh, in that we truly do like cash flow. Uh, we do not do a ton of value add. Uh, primarily, we are buying in the Midwest and Southeast, and we're buying Class B and C plus real estate in uh, A to B locations. Uh, we have a long-term perspective, uh, so not, uh, again, doing much uh, fix and flip type stuff. And then we're buying in tertiary markets, uh, buying a deal right now in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, and, uh, you know, there's less institutional capital flowing into those areas. Uh, and consequently, the cap rates are, are better. Um, and, uh, and then there's less supply risk as well. So, uh, you know, developers are not building in Montgomery where, uh, they cannot justify the cost of construction with 85 cent rents. Um, so, you know, 12, 15 year debt on our deals and then a granular approach to asset management. But that's kind of, that's my past and, and what we're doing now. Cool. Teddy. Uh, my name is Ted Hallaby. I grew up here in Denver as well and uh, started off in real estate, actually in 08, buying foreclosures on single family homes in Denver County areas, um, Metro Denver areas. And so I uh, was doing, you know, fix and flips in the home, single family home uh, around Denver Metro. And then in 2014-15, uh, uh, decided to kind of scale that and go to the multifamily and, and uh, do the fix and flip there and the value add. Um, so bought first apartment building um, in 14 or 15 and since then uh, did primarily syndications on deals and we like to sit, you know, kind of in that uh, space right below the institutional groups where uh, it's above the mom and pops but under the institutional capital and that's where we find our best returns. It's a little more work than what most shops would be doing just because of the smaller uh, units but uh, we've we see that's our best opportunity, uh, you know, pre-COVID with the value add, and we're still going to stick with our strategy. Um, and we're buying um, all in Colorado at the moment, and uh, C minus properties. We like to bring them up to a C plus or B minus, and we'll either hold or sell. Um, always a seller after a year and a day, and now kind of a three years and a day, but. Um, 
we transitioned from one-off syndications a couple years ago and uh, started a fund of uh, pooling, you know, capital and all the assets under one umbrella. And we haven't sold any of that, but uh, it's been like two and a half years. Uh, we've already deployed all that capital and we're in the beginning stages of raising our second fund um, of a $50 million fund to go out and buy again, C minus um, multifamily, probably a hundred units or less in that area. Um, for the long term, maybe there's opportunities from dislocations from COVID. We don't know. Uh, that would add to our returns if there are opportunities there. But if not, we feel like there's always underperforming assets in that C minus class that can always have a uh, value add plan. And so uh, that's kind of where we're headed right now. Two quick questions, Ted. Who sold you your first apartment? <clears throat> Adam Riddle sold my first apartment. <laughs> He, 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 uh, he got me addicted early. Perfect. Um, and then you, you own in Colorado, like what's the, what's the gamut of where you own in Colorado? Um, so we're, we're kind of, uh, across the board. Um, Denver Metro really, uh, we have a, we have a, uh, a lot of investments in Lakewood, um, some in, uh, smaller in central Denver, um, you know, we're still trying to get comfortable with those price per pound on, on those units. Um, but uh, we've gone as far north as Fort Collins and uh, talk about tertiary markets. Uh, we went down to Trinidad and did a value add play there. And that's actually our, our best cash flowing property. So, um, yeah, go figure. But um, uh, we're, we're now, you know, like you, tertiary markets um, looking for opportunities where most groups don't want to spend their time or effort or energy. And we're not too worried about cash flow year one or two uh, while we're implementing our value add repositioning. And so we'll look at what cash flow is like year two or three, but we're really um, back ended on, on, on generating the most returns uh, by getting in low on the front end and, and doing our repositioning. And then uh, hopefully that value comes on the back end when we sell it. Cool. Um, well, thank both, thanks both of you for joining us. I'm um, anxious to hear some uh, of the conversation, continue to the conversation that we were all having yesterday. Um, again, Adam Riddle, Nexus Commercial Realty. Uh, just to give you a brief kind of update on where we're at on the brokerage side, um, we are as busy as we've ever been. Um, some of that is obviously we think some pent up demand from kind of uh, late March, April, May. Um, we are seeing a very strong influx of capital. Um, not that there was a shortage of capital into the market beforehand, but there is an even greater influx of capital right now of exchanges and, and uh, some of these other markets that are trying to pour, pour money into markets like here in Phoenix and Salt Lake. Um, debt is still very good. So I think that's continuing to help drive um, some of what we're seeing on the demand side, but um, the, the uh, apartment market here in Denver and Colorado Springs is just doing really, really well thus far. Um, I looked up NMHC's rent tracker. They're at 90% collections for August. Um, so obviously still going strong there. I think um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit today on kind of what we, what some of the thoughts are over the next 60 to 90 days. But um, overall, uh, the market is doing well. Uh, developers are still out looking for projects. We've got quite a few land sites in our contract with national developers, so they're still bullish on the market. So uh, I'm sure there's different pockets around the country that might be struggling a little bit more than maybe Denver is, but Denver and Colorado Springs right now seem to be doing pretty well. So, um, so let's get into it. Um, Greg, you are uh, actively buying. Um, we discussed yesterday you're you're a newer a newer company, so not really in a position to, to sell, even if you wanted to sell today, but um, why are you still buying and, and, and what makes you still um, actively buying in, in what some people consider kind of a scary market? Yeah, so I mean, kind of my overall thoughts on the market and, and, and I'll caveat all this by saying that had I started this company 10 years ago, we very well may be net sellers this year, but uh, it's not the case and uh, we're not gonna flip out of deals uh, with long-term debt that we bought, you know, 18 months ago. But, um, you know, I'll start by saying the, the very obvious, um, which is that, I, you know, I'm no economist. So wh whatever I'm about to say, my two cents, uh, take it down with a you know a spoonful of salt. Uh, but 
you know, multifamily and other investments have, since I've been in the business, steadily seen returns go down. Uh, and, you know, no secrets as to why, but there's been massive uh, influxes of capital, uh, interest rates have gone down, and, uh, and as a result, we're seeing inflated asset prices, and, and that can certainly be scary. Um, having said that, the fundamentals remain very strong. And even in the midst of this pandemic, as Adam, you alluded to, uh, multifamily specifically has been extraordinarily resilient. Uh, our portfolio has seen uh, dramatically increased occupancy. We're uh, right around 96% occupied, uh, our whole portfolio is, uh, and uh, we're collecting about 98% of our rents. I think the driving force in occupancy shooting up for us is that resident retention has gone up. So uh, where we were seeing renewal retention called around 55%, we're now seeing it as high as 70% at some properties. Uh, and then uh, our collections, you know, hovering around 98, that's really right around our, our, our average. We might be lagging by a percent here and there, but uh, it's nothing that we can really deem as being systematic quite yet. So with that, uh, you know, fundamentals still being strong, rents still being um, pushed in a positive direction, albeit mostly from renewals and not as much, I think, from, uh, from new move-ins. Uh, you know, you, we got co collections or uh, concessions relatively flat in most of our markets. So um, while I think there are opportunities in any market to buy, uh, I do think that you need to be very cautious, right? Because as we hit the tail end of this cycle, the rising tide is not going to save deals where, you know, people overpaid, uh, at least not in the short term. So I don't know if that answered your question as to why we buy, but, um, you know, I think we're still finding good opportunities that are in our markets substantially below replacement costs. There's very healthy cash on cash returns out there. The debt, sir, we're, we're hyper-focused on, you know, how do you hedge, right? Because I think it's been great so far, but what happens in the next quarter? What happens uh, in the next year? And this first stimulus is expiring now. If I'm a betting man, I think there's gonna be a second stimulus leading into an election year. Um, but that's the downside risk, right? Is, is what the next year looks like. And, you know, in order to hedge, you know, we're very cautious about our loans values. We like to make sure we have very robust debt service coverages. And um, so, yeah, just a few areas of, of uh, focus as we buy. Ed, you are um, been buying deals, obviously, for a little bit longer than, um, than Greg has and have a little different strategy, but you are currently out there with uh, at least three deals on the sell side. Um, what made you think uh, right now is maybe a good time to to uh, cycle through a few of those deals? So, yeah, we do have three properties that we're um, unloading right now. And uh, to be truthful, we were actually planning on selling them before COVID hit. And uh, we've got one under contract, you know, Right, right near list price, and we're hopeful to get another one um, near our list price as well. And we see the activity still there for buyers. Um, we're not currently buying, or I guess actively buying. We're, I still believe that you know, I'm I'm not a market timer, um, definitely not an economist. But if you can find a good asset in a decent location, you know, for C C class type guys, you know if we can get a good asset with decent numbers and we're not overpaying, you know, I'd still buy in this market and, and take on whatever comes uh, moving forward. We usually put lower leverage on our deals anyways, uh, which you know sucks when you're dealing, but then in times like these, it, you're glad you did it. But on the sales side, again, um, we think that there's still 1031 um, buyers out there that uh, would still like to defer their taxes. And uh, with our value add, these are more turnkey, um, projects for these new buyers where they're not going to have to put in a lot of CapEx or a lot of value add at all, where I think that kind of alleviates some of the risk for when they buy uh, with unit turns and vacancies, um, just things they don't have to worry about, especially if uh, there is a change in dislocation from what falls off with these stimulus plans or whatnot. But, um, you know, I would bet there'd be another wave of the stimulus. I think Colorado has a 300 a week now kind of boost for unemployment. I don't know, I gotta look into that. But 
Um, regardless, I think we're going to face a dip here um, in the fourth quarter and first quarter potentially, you know, might provide some buying opportunities, but uh, we're selling deals that we think are really strong deals that there's, you know, not much to argue with for any buyer to see why they're good locations. They've uh, had a lot of money put into them. They've had great um, occupancy over the years. And um, I don't look at them as risky assets at all, but, you know, we're putting them out there just to kind of see what the appetite is. And we've been, you know, pleasantly surprised. Um, Ted, what do you, I mean, in today's market, did you do anything different to get your property ready for a sale? Um, besides try to obviously keep occupancy in place. Anything else that you did differently? I mean, I know you did a value add strategy on a few of them, you know, years ago, that's, that's still holding strong, but is there anything that you might've done um, differently to get it ready kind of going? Cause I think a lot of these came out in the last you know, kind of 45, 60 days, kind of when we were on the tail end of, uh, of lockdown, um, was there something that you strategized differently to do to get them ready for the market? Not really. Um, you know, the numbers are kind of what they are. The collections are what they are. The, de the deficiencies are what they are. And I think buyers understand that there's going to be, a, you know, 10% deficiencies that keep adding up each month. And um, which I think is a total disservice to the tenants um, by keeping them in and just building up this huge deficiency that they're never going to get off their back. But that's a different story. Um, so I think it's just in the underwriting of the, of the buyers and then, you know, talking with the lenders. Uh, I know we're going to get into the debt side and what their requirements are, but um, there's really nothing that I changed. Uh, it was nice that most of the buildings were, uh, you know, almost 100% occupied. You might have one or you know, vacant maybe uh, across all three of them. So um, there wasn't much to do. And again, since we do do the value add piece, there wasn't much to do in terms of uh, deferred maintenance or any additional CapEx. It's really just, you know, deliver a turnkey asset to somebody. Cool. Greg, so you're out in a lot of different markets. Obviously you're covering uh, quite a geographical area. Um, you know, you guys are probably, I imagine seeing deal flow as, as deal flow in, in Colorado, I know has picked up dramatically in the last 60 days. Um, what gets you excited about a deal today? Are you seeing those, D deep discounts, you know, some distress, maybe not bank owned, but just somebody really needing to get out. Um, or is it just some, uh, you know, management deficiencies or what, what gets a deal to kind of rise to the top of you guys is uh, a pile, if you will. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I think I'm not uh, probably saying anything that uh, everyone else isn't thinking, but you know, deals have become less and less exciting over the years. Uh, when I started, uh, you know, it sounds silly, but we would scoff at anything south of a, an 11% uh, return that was with an amortizing loan. Uh, and now, you know, what we look for is 8 and 10% yields, which are still, you know, really healthy. Um, but that's with interest only debt. Uh, so that's primarily what we look for. You know, we are, uh, Ted and I are on different ends of, I would say, the risk reward spectrum, right? Um, we like to buy a lot of post value added stuff. Um, so a, a lot of our stuff has already been renovated and we'll buy it uh, from a group who's done a deep renovation. And we do that because there's far less capital chasing those deals, right? So we can go in and buy it at a cap rate that we actually understand. Uh, and we know we're not gonna take six cap to a eight or nine cap, um, but with modest growth over a long period, um, those returns get well into the double digits, um, which is uh, enough for us to be happy. So I guess that's probably what excites us these days. I, I think we're also, we remain cautiously optimistic. I, I like Ted, don't think that, uh, I think there's the worst is probably ahead of us, but I don't know that there are going to be significant uh, distressed, uh, a significant influx of distressed deals. Uh, you know, we're seeing some of that here and there, but I think um, looking back uh, seven, eight years ago, there was certainly more of it then than we're seeing now. And uh, that could change in the, in the months to come, but um, that's, that's really what we're looking for. Adam, it's something that's is probably a little bit lower on the, on the risk spectrum that has a uh, greater ease of execution 
um, where we know over the long haul we'll be able to grow our quarterly dividends. Yeah, that makes sense. Ted, so you've obviously got uh, properties out there and you've got buyers coming and looking and, and writing offers and LOIs and whatnot. You know, what do you say to the buyer that comes in and says, you know, it's COVID, you've got some delinquencies, you know, they're an opportunistic buyer and they, they're expecting a discount. What's, what's your response to that without saying curse words? <laughs> um, you know, I, um, I think whether there's COVID or delinquencies or not, I think a lot of buyers are always trying to get a discount. Like I do too. Like I get it. You're always trying to get a good deal. I would, um, my response, you know, is we don't need to sell these. We're putting them out there. Um, we don't think we're really trying to top take a market or, or get, um, above market prices. Uh, I would, I would say, look, if you're not comfortable with it, it's probably not the right deal for you. But, um, you know, over time, you know, are you buying it for next month's rent roll or are you buying it for the longer term, the, you know, the asset itself and its location and, um, we're, we're no need to sell. And so we're definitely not going to sell at a huge discount. A lot of our thought process right now is look, let's sell it at this price or close to this price. If we don't get that price, rates are so cheap. Let's just refinance it, pull out some cash, longer term debt. I know you don't want to hear this longer term debt, uh, longer interest only payments, and we'll just sit on it and get some cash out and get ready to buy. If there is going to be some of that dislocation, you know, like Greg said, I don't think there's going to be an influx of distressed deals coming in. There might be, um, we'd like to be ready. Uh, that's, you know, part of, of the second fund is we'll be there if, if there is, opportunity, but if not, we'll just keep doing what we're doing with uh, underperforming assets and, and bringing them up. Makes sense. Um, Long-term debt, bad for the brokers, by the way. Yeah, we know. <laughs> it's un-American. Uh, yeah, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so you guys both have a little bit of different strategies, as you both pointed out. Um, much more of a, a, a long-term approach, Greg, but I know um, at your previous shop, you guys did a lot of everything um, from, from value add deals to long term to ground up. Um, just talk about why, why two years ago you kind of picked that, hey, I'm going to go buy these deals and we're going to put as long a term debt as I can get on it um, versus some of the other strategies that you saw at your previous shop. Was it yeah, by, well, by the market just... at the time or kind of just where, where was your head at? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a few um, uh, points uh, to make on that. So Forum is a, a, a massive entity now, right? And we had a full-fledged development group. Uh, and I'll be the first to say uh, that if I send you a development deck, you know, really review it because uh, I'm not a developer at this point. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, I don't really uh, mess around in that space. And I know it's been a, a tough space uh, recently to make the numbers were with construction costs going up as well. So it's been one that I've been candidly a little less interested in myself. And then as we get deeper into this cycle, you know, I look back and, and you think about uh, missed opportunities or areas where you could have done even better. And, uh, you know, the value add space has been phenomenal uh, for the last eight years. As we hit the tail end of a cycle, and, and maybe Ted agrees, maybe he doesn't with this, but I think, you know, it, interesting that you're selling a lot of stuff right now, Ted, um, which is kind of um, along the lines of what I, with what I'm about to say. But you know, I, I think as the, as you get deeper into the cycle, these value add opportunities become fewer and fewer, right? And uh, and there's less upside in the deals. A lot of these rents have already been pushed, and and you got to be careful, right? Because you don't want to get caught in the value trap where. You got you buy a great price per pound, but it's just on the wrong corner. Um, and and so you know, for me, what what I like, and and I'm pretty risk averse. You know, I like, to, and and I've been wrong here, right? I've been fixing interest rates since I've been in the business, and it's funny for the last five or six years, we've been sitting there looking at each other, thinking, you know, how can rates not go up? When are rates going to go up? And, uh, and, and, you know, we're laughing kind of at all these guys who keep floating their debt. Uh, and, you know, in hindsight, they've had the last laugh. Um, but, you know, I, in, in my eyes, if I can get a 12 or 15 year note on my deal, fix the interest rate, get out of the gate, 
darn near a double digit cash on cash return, then I'm going to sleep really well at night. And, you know, the vast majority of these deals, there's tons of granular uh, tweaks that you can make on the income side, on the expense side to really juice yield. And, uh, you know, the other, you know, beautiful thing, and, and I don't want to, you know, I know we're going to talk about debt in a little bit, uh, I'm sure, but, you know, we, we do Freddie Fannie debt on almost all of our deals. And so while we go long and we handcuff ourselves in a way with big prepays, we're still able to recap these deals through supplemental loans. So, and, you know, and more tax efficient, by the way. Uh, so, you know, I think to answer your question, you know, I like higher debt service coverages uh, and, and that's what draws me to it. I like the cash flow. Uh, we align ourselves with our investors uh, through shared cash flow. We don't take big fees up front and we don't have, you know, a huge back end. So we don't get kind of caught in this IRR chase, um, which I think uh, a lot of folks just operate in that space. Um, we can be a little more patient uh, with our structure. And I think, uh, so, so I guess to answer your question, that, that's why I'm, I'm drawn to it. And then you're obviously chasing, I mean, what's, what's the minimum doors you're looking at in these markets? Yeah. So, I mean, typical deal for us is, uh, uh, north of $10 million, uh, and 150 units, um, something between, between 10 and, uh, 35 is probably our sweet spot. Uh, and, and we're buying seventies, eighties, vintage deals. We've bought some properties in, uh, suburbs of Detroit, which have, have performed very well. Um, and uh, recently just closed one in Tallahassee, which is our third deal down there, uh, which is, you know, state capital. You have tons of public sector employment there that isn't going anywhere. Uh, universities, and I never thought I'd say it, are uh, probably more at risk now than you ever thought they would be. But I, I have to believe that this is probably going to be a shorter term hurt. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we've, we've been able to find opportunities in those markets. There's certainly more mom and pop owners in those markets. And that's diminished over the last eight years. But, uh, you know, I think that there's good buying opportunities in every market. You just need to kind of uh, dig through and, and find them. You know, my analyst is not here right now, but he'd laugh. You know, we're underwriting over 100 deals for every deal that we actually hit on. And the last three deals that we've done have been relationship buys, uh, both from groups that we have uh, purchased from in the past, which helps. Yeah, it's great. So Ted, coming from the uh, fix and flip world, um, you know, your strategy was obviously more the value add and, and you've touched on it a bit, but um, you know, it was heavy value add. And I think it's kind of morphed over, over the years in the last six years, but why the value add was that equity driven? Was that just, Hey, this is a space I know. Um, but kind of why, why go down that path? You know, um, it's funny because, you know, a lot of people, most people think, and I guess it's in textbooks, you know, value adds riskier. Um, in my, my view is that it's less risky. You know, if I can buy something and add value at my cost, instead of paying for it at someone else's cost, uh, plus, <clears throat> you know, their margin on it. Um, I feel like if a market is going to turn, you know, my cost basis is whatever my acquisition is, plus all the upgrades at that cost. And I feel like I know enough vendors and have worked with enough vendors to get the best quality for the cheapest price. So again, you know, I always look at things on the downside that if, you know, things did fall, if rents fell, if vacancy increased, you know, where's, where's our, our, our hurt point. And if, in my view, if I bought something that someone else already fixed up and I paid them a premium for it, I don't have much downside protection if if rents or vacancies, if rents uh, decrease or vacancies increase. Again, you know, that depends on location and, you know, a hundred other factors, but I just, you know, like to bring in the capital on the front end, take care of everything and then see where it stands in terms of the cash flow um, and the valuation of it. And then I'd rather have someone, you know, pay us for the work we did. Um, and if they don't, then we've just got that much more cushion if, if things did drop. I, right. Just to add to that, Ted, I completely agree. And I, and I think largely it's probably a difference of markets as well. Totally. 
because oh, when Ted's yeah. exiting his deals here in the greater Denver area, they're going to be at far lower caps than we're, we're buying, you know, in these tertiary Midwest and Southeast markets. And that to me, buying those at the stabilized deals at lower caps that have less upside. Um, and, uh, and especially as we, you know, have this kind of looming, uh, delinquency thing that's floating in the back of our heads, uh, you know, um, among other things, right. Uh, tons of supply coming online here in the A space as well. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd be a little more cautious as well, buying at lower caps in, in cities like this. Well, especially, you know, that's why I don't look here. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and what's funny is like, you know, I'd love to just buy something that cash flows at a double digit. I don't, I don't have to, you know, take the risk of the value add piece, but you know, Colorado is just such a hot market. I mean, you're buying on cap rates for, you know, pro forma and you're essentially paying the seller for the work that you're going to do without it being proven. And it's worked in the last, you know, 10 years because the market's been going up. So it'll be really interesting to see, you know, if there is a dip in the market, everyone that purchased, you know, including myself, um, that, you know, you buy a little bit on pro forma and, you know, if that pro forma doesn't hit because rents are going to be softening or vacancies are going to be increasing, you know, what happens to those type of properties where, um, you know, with, again, I mentioned the second fund, you know, I'd like to have, um, you know, a small value add piece to, um, to a cash flowing deal as well as the, the heavier value adds. But I think I'm leaning more towards, you know, let's, let's see what's proven currently and buy into that rather than being in a time where, okay, look, I know the properties down the street that are similar are getting these in rents. If we, you know, take on a bunch of vacancy, put a bunch of capital in and however many months that takes, you know, we're going to achieve those rents. I think that's just a much riskier play right now. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting when you talk to people from around the country, and, and Greg, you guys look all over the place, but um, Denver has always been a pro forma kind of value add buy. Um, you know, it's not a, you know, it's a blank cap rate over the trailing three or six or heaven forbid, 12. Um, so, you know, we have, some, we have a lot of people that come into the market on the principal side and ask us, you know, well, what is the T12? And it's like, well, if this needs to really pencil on T12. It's kind of hard to buy in this market, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if it, that changes a lot. Um, thus far, it hasn't changed a lot. There's still a capital that we'll use in the market. And, um, and you know, it, value add is, is so different. Greg, to your point earlier, I mean, everybody's value add. You know, you go to NMHC and it's like 90% of the people there are value add that can mean a ton of different things that can be management that can be renovations that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people um we've even had some value add groups approach us and say you know instead of paying a five cap for a value add i'll pay a four seven five for a new construction and just put put more money down and just get a 40 year old newer building the the spread for the value add versus new construction uh you know, has definitely shrunk over the last two or three years. Um, obviously, post COVID, we'll see what happens. But um, it's always interesting going and talking to everybody, and they're always value add, value add, value add. So, yeah, it's it's uh, like it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And you know, I'd, I'd ask Adam this, but I'll just say it a little bit sarcastically. You know, when's the last time you guys sent out a deck that didn't have value add plastered on the front of it, right? <laughs> and and. Uh, but you know, it, but it's it's funny. I mean, the growth's been there in in the past, and I think the question now that people are finally asking themselves is what what does the next year look like, right? And uh, yeah, we, I mean, we sold a deal in, in in Birmingham to a group that won't remain nameless, but we bought it from a value add group, and then a value add group bought it from us eighteen months later, and we were just thinking to ourselves, I just don't understand what we're missing on this one, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I get it. Well, let's get into um, let's get into a little bit of equity, and then this uh, we'll talk some debt. But um, Greg, you are a deal by deal guy. Uh, Ted, you have done syndications in the past. Uh, I've done one smaller fund, raising your your second fund. So let's let's kind of talk about um, Craig, kind of why you why you do the deal by deal. What's your what's your thought process? Yeah, yeah, sure. So so we have a, and and I don't know that you know. I don't want to uh, have anyone call me out on this if I end up switching, but I don't know that we have any long-term plans to, to deviate from syndicating deal by deal. Uh, 
I like the flexibility that it, that it gives us, uh, you know, especially heading into, um, uh, you know, a downturn in a market when uh, some groups have just raised, you know, $500 million funds that they got to go into place. That's a scary proposition to me or um, being forced to sell at the wrong time. That's not a pressure that I want, you know, because my fund horizon is, is turning. Um, so, yeah, we, we syndicate our deals with um, friends and family money, uh, high net worths, family offices. Uh, a lot of our deals do have a 1031 component. Um, there was a time when most of those were internal, but again, having a new company, uh, we're not, uh, we're not going to cradle the grave quite yet on, on most of our deals. Um, so, you know, we've, we've had success doing that. It was, uh, you know, candidly, when starting my own company, that was, you know, the biggest scare. You just don't know, uh, you know, if the equity is going to be there or not and, uh, feel very uh, fortunate that we've uh, had a uh, good experience raising equity that way. I, I think in the last couple years, two years, we raised about 60 or 65 million um, on the deals that we've bought. Uh, and, you know, I guess that, I, I don't know that it's something that we change. Um, you know, if, if the question is whether or not we do a fund or not. Uh, having said that, you know, um, there is obviously, there's the ability to raise massive amounts of capital with funds. And, um, and you can have great flexibility if they're structured properly. It's just probably not something that we gravitate to, uh, at least not in the near term. So you've raised uh, some money uh, for a couple of deals here post COVID. Um, are you getting any pushback? Are you getting people kind of saying not right now, or I'm expecting a higher return because of what's going on in the world? And what's, what's raising money been like in the last three or four months? Yeah, I don't know that it's changed a ton for us. And I think the benefit of our structure is that we have such diversity in our investor base that if, if it's not the right time for one group, it's probably going to at least be the right time for a different group. And so, um, you know, we have not had issues subscribing our deals. They, uh, they subscribe pretty quickly. And, um, and, 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 you know, to the point of higher returns, you know, I think when we're sending out decks at this point, um, we like to be able to tell a story that we're believing, <laughs> you know, in terms of, uh, you know, a, a lower leverage point or easy upside that's going to get us to a, an even more comfortable spot. Um, and then really just kind of sticking to our guns on what our year one yields are and our debt service coverages are. But most of our deals come out of the gate north of a 2.0 debt service coverage. Um, and I mean, we talk about downside scenarios, everyone's looking at their daily collection tracker, right? And uh, which is <laughs> such a reactive way to do it. There's obviously tons of proactive things that I'm doing and I'm sure Ted is doing uh, similarly. Um, but, you know, we would need to see our collections as a percentage of charges drop to about 70% um, at our current occupancy rates before we hit a 1.0. Um, and even then we have these robust capital accounts. So I just, I don't see, a doomsday scenario being all that grim for multifamily. You know, there's tons of capital out there still. Interest rates are even lower than they were. And then nationally, um, and this was a Newmark report that I had read recently, but nationally we're seeing transaction volume plummet, uh, you know, by, by about 70% from Q2 to Q1 of this year. Um, and so coupled with strong fundamentals still, I just don't see you know, I, I see that maybe there's a, a dip um, in delinquencies here, um, but I, I mean, if interest rates stay low, I almost have to think that cap rates could continue to follow them down when we come out the other side. And it's not to say we're not planning for the worst, but, uh, you know, I think with that in mind, I don't know that there's been a ton of resistance on the equity side. Right. So, Ted, you, you kind of uh, switched from syndications to, to a fund model. Uh, walk us through the thought process there and walk us through how this kind of second fund is going as far as um, talking to the to investors who are putting money in it and, and what their appetite is and what their expectations are. Are they better? Are they uh, more advantageous to the investor? It was very similar to your last fund that I think you raised a couple of years ago at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's definitely pros and cons with the fund. Greg pointed out, you know, a lot of them. Um, 
you know, having to put that money to work in a certain time period, you know, having to exit, depending on your docs, what you need to do. Um, you know, big one is if, you know, let's say you have 10 properties in your first five, you sell when the market's good and then you're forced to sell the other five, you know, when the market turns a little bit, you just wiped out your whole fund um, in terms of your carry because each one is, is, um, is, is put together with the others where on a one-off syndication, if you do well on that, you're rewarded for that based on your terms and the carry. And if the other one, you know, you sell flat and it sells flat, they're not, uh, you know, commingled together like a fund. But, um, you know, what I first starting off when I was syndicating deals, you know, you get a deal under contract, you have a gun to your head to, you know, create an offering memorandum, get the debt, inspect the property, things change. You got to meet with investors face to face. You got to talk to them. You don't really know who's an investor with this type of, you know, capital that is looking for these types of deals. And so, um, you know, and you just build on those investor bases and referrals over time, but, you know, you want to do bigger deals, you know, you got to put up earnest money, you got to, you know, kind of take a bunch of risks with that to make sure you can put all the capital together for closing. Um, and so that was always, you know, my stress factor during the deals. And if you have a couple deals going at once, you know, it's just double that. So um, a couple of investors came to me and said, why don't you do a fund? And, you know, I kind of talked to them about the known negatives of it. And they kind of tried to talk to me about the positives of it. And I said, you know, you know, kind of nothing ventured, nothing gained. So did a, you know, smaller fund um, with just high net worth groups. And I'll tell you, it was great being able to call capital and 10 days later, it hit your account to go buy something or, you know, to go improve something. So uh, that was the nice part. It was, it was, uh, it was, it was, you know, a long time to raise and, and get there. And, you know, it, you know, a fund is blind, right? People have got to trust you that you're going to a say what you're going to do and they can't go and see and touch the property like a, a syndication that Greg's putting together. He has a picture of it. He has all the information on it. In a fund, it's like, no, just trust me, I'm going to do what I say. And if you don't have that strong relationship with someone, you know, it's kind of difficult for someone to kind of give you a good slug of money to do that. Uh, but with fund two, um, talking with investors, uh, same as Greg kind of mentioned, there's no really pushback right now. You hear of a lot of funds being created with what's going on. I think the stock market is helping drive that kind of confidence. Um, I have no idea why the stock market keeps, you know, doing well with what we're seeing on delinquencies and vacancies and, and other businesses that we're in. But, um, you know, confidence is still there. You know, people haven't lost any wealth through this, the, the investors that invest in our type of properties. Um, so, uh, so far so good on, on talking with people and their interest in the fund. And, um, and so we're hoping to have that, you know, rolled up by, you know, early fourth quarter with a, you know, longer investment period where we can sit back and wait a little bit just to see how things unfold. The election's a huge concern of ours. Um, and, uh, you know, who knows, but I think if there is going to be some movement, it's, it's got to be in the first quarter, maybe even second quarter of next year. And with the, with the fund, you know, you have people locked in, so you can be patient and then you can be aggressive when you need to. And you know, you've got the backing behind you where, you know, someone's mind can't change, you know, the next month because of the election and say, oh, hey, I was committed for this amount of money. And now I'm, I'm, I'm going in a total different direction. So that comfort for me, for what, you know, we want to do is, is, is worth it to, you know, rule out those negatives that, you know, are inherent with doing a fund. I like it. Um, Greg, quick, quick side note question. Then we're going to get a little bit into debt. Um, somebody was wondering just, you know, two years, 1500 units, you know, it's a lot of properties and you're covering a lot of markets. Like what's your infrastructure? Like how many people you have with you? What are the roles? Like what other resources do, did you use uh, to yeah. grow so rapidly? Yeah. So, so Ted and I actually were talking about this yesterday a little bit. And uh, you know, I, I don't, had you told me that we would have bought that many units that quickly uh, in, in this new venture two years ago, <laughs> but uh, you know the opportunities presented themselves, and then I very much structured this candidly the the way that I learned to structure it, which is uh, through a cradle to grave approach. And I was fortunate enough to be able to hire an asset manager who um, 
that that uh, title carries a little bit of a different meaning here. Um, uh, you know, uh, here that person is not only asset managing a deal, but they're buying it and selling it. And so, with that level of autonomy and trust and responsibility, you're able to kind of uh, delegate a lot more, right? And there's obviously uh, more equity that is comp going to compensate those people, rightfully so, right? Because they're um, they're performing a higher level of work. Um, but so, so the structure is me and an asset manager who's who's performing more than just that title would uh, lead on, and then an analyst. And we have regional uh, property management groups who um, are based uh, in the areas that we're buying, who I have prior relationships with. And that's where really, and Ted, I'll say it too, I'm sure, but that's where the magic happens. Um, and you need to make sure you have very strong talent uh, at, the, at the management level um, to be able to scale like we have. Because if those deals weren't performing, uh, then I can you know, darn well assure you that our investors would not be there for us on the next deal. Um, but they've been doing very well and it, it has everything to do with the people. And um, at a point in the market where a lot of other sectors are really struggling. We're finding that we're needing to, you know, raise salaries pretty meaningfully for on-site employees. Uh, we're bonusing folks to keep them keep them uh, in their seats and uh, keep them happy. Um, but that's kind of the infrastructure that we work with, and and we're constantly building it out. We just started uh, an advisory board, uh, working through succession planning, uh, getting bylaws drafted for all of that. So you know you're. We used to say this uh, at the old shop, but you're, you know, we're very much, you know, building the plane as we're flying it. Uh, and I think that's something that you're kind of constantly doing as you're uh, stepping into new levels of your business. Uh, but something that uh, it's, 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 uh, it's something that we've scaled uh, through a team that has worked together um, at this current company and prior. And that, that part is helpful. Yeah. Cool. Well, we don't have long here. Um, I also want to remind everybody if they have questions, please type it in the chat function. Um, but let's hit on debt a little bit. Um, we've kind of talked about it high level, but um, you know, Greg, in, in your new new deals you're doing right now, um, how different is debt than it was six months ago? Besides maybe being a little cheaper on interest rate, but you know, how different is it? Um, talk about getting comfortable with the escrows that Fannie and Freddie are making you do, and, and, and how how you get investors comfortable with that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I remember, uh, Adam, when I initially interviewed uh, to get into the business, uh, my boss at the time, who was a, I have all, uh, so much respect for him, uh, but he also a very intense guy. He sat there and he said, how do we do what we do? And he just kind of kept repeating himself. And I had no idea where he was going with it, but uh, he then said, you know, it's debt. Yeah, Freddie and Fanny are too cheap. And, and there's definitely some validity to that. Right. And so we, almost exclusively use Freddie and Fannie, primarily Fannie. Um, we love their debt. Uh, the execution, ease of execution is there. Uh, the rates are unbelievable. We're working on a deal right now that we're going to lock rate on hopefully in the next couple of weeks and close, as Ted was saying, as far in advance of this election as we possibly can. And uh, we're anticipating locking right around 3% for 12 years. And I just, you know, with cap rates relatively unchanged in the last six months, that adds to our returns. Um, so- uh, You do some IO with that? Yeah, we, on a 12 year loan, we'll do four or five years of interest only, 15, maybe five or six. Uh, I like having a little IO on the front end, it gives you a much more comfort in your debt service coverage uh, and the ability to have a few more years to grow your cash flows prior to uh, amming that loan. Um, typically we're not maxing out leverage unless there's some really easy and obvious upside. And then you mentioned the escrows. Uh, so uh, a couple things of note. So those escrows can be, you know, they can kill a deal. Um, and so what we've just kind of internally decided is that given the short term nature of those escrows, we're just going to, uh, internally fund them, uh, through, you know, the company and, uh, uh, one or two partners, depending on the size of them. And we'll just do a low interest uh, loan that'll be prepaid at par uh, in nine or 12 months when those are released. And we view that as a way to not really penalize the deal and still get deals done so we can kind of grow the size of the pie, not 
our slice of it. And uh, so, yeah, but the, you know, I mean, there's other good things that are going on too. I mean, the uh, green program is, um, you know, having somewhat of a resurgence right now as well. And one that we're going to be uh, executing on, on this next deal. So, but the, you know, and I just, you know, I guess in summary, Freddie and Fannie are phenomenal. You know, the, the caveat to a lot of what I've said is that we did buy a distressed deal that was going to get auctioned off um, just because I saw the opportunity and we owned a couple neighboring properties. It just made all the sense in the world and we, and we preempted the auction process, which didn't hurt either. Um, but uh, the, that, that deal was really difficult to finance. Um, and, and I'm curious to hear Ted's thoughts, but, you know, the value add space, what we're seeing, and we don't, again, have the biggest balance sheet uh, on the block, but uh, banks have been more skittish, at least with us. Um, and so we were fortunate to, uh, if, to get that deal, which was not stabilized finance through a life company that's been very active in the space. But that's been, that's been a bit more tricky is financing the non-stabilized deals. Yeah. So that brings me to, to Ted. So I know you've done Fannie and Freddie as well, but uh, with a lot of the value add stuff, especially in kind of the space that uh, you've played in, um, you have had to go the traditional banking route. Um, talk about why you would do that, why you would potentially sign recourse, um, and what you think the upside of doing that is. Sure. Uh, you know, for anyone who, who has not done agency debt, um, you know, the biggest difference between agency and bank debt is agency debt looks at trailing numbers and bank debt looks at pro forma numbers. So, you know, being a value add uh, shop, um, you know, trailing numbers suck on a value add deal. So that's all Freddie Mac can use. And so your leverage that you get from them is very low. And so, um, and they don't do construction loans on the small balance side with, you know, under a hundred units. So, Essentially, you know, let's, you know, for example, you get a 65% loan, you have to bring everything else to the table, you know, loan fees, um, all your CapEx and your unit uh, renovations. So your overall LTV, when you're done with your whole, you know, repositioning, you know, drops down to a 60 or 55% LTV. Um, and so what you're doing is you're just kind of diluting the returns on your deal. Um, you know, you can get away with it by putting on some flexible, some flexible prepay, uh, you know, Denver and Colorado is a top tier market. You can get a 310 uh, prepay. And so you could recapitalize it after that. But again, you just dilute everyone's returns. So um, if it's bad enough and we know we're getting a property that's in a good location and we're really, really confident that on a price per pound and what we're gonna do um, and the numbers are terrible from Freddie, we will go to bank debt and sign the recourse and get a construction loan. And just, it really is just a higher leverage play. And then you can recapitalize with a Freddie Mac loan to take you out, you know, after a year or two and, and go that route. But, you know, it's just really interesting that, you know, one giant is, is backward looking and another giant's forward looking and, and with value add, it's just, you know, what they've been doing recently depends on what kind of leverage you can get. We, we don't get a three, two, one, by the way. And we, we were laughing about this yesterday, but I mean, all of our deals are yield maintenance, you know, Freddie's mostly defeasance. Uh, so we have significant prepays and uh, we view there as being liquidity still through supplementals, but uh, you know, that's certainly a, a downfall of the long-term debt. Sure, and especially, I mean, in, in you know, small, small balance, Freddie, you can't put supplementals on. So there's, you know, a lot of just moving parts and you just kind of got to get quotes from both of them and figure out which one you want to go with. And if you want to sign personally, how much you believe in it and you know how much it affects the returns. But, you know, I remember probably like three or four years ago, a lot of deals that we would see would, you know, Freddie would have like an 80% LTV and it was still a value add deal. And that has just shrunk considerably since then. I mean, the last year, I don't think I've seen an LTV above 68% on a value add. I mean, a lot of that can be just, you know, the perception, the market, the brokers talking to the sellers, the pricing, you know, everything like that. But, um, you know, before, if you got an 80% LTV on a value add deal from Freddie, you did it no matter what, um, because they have all the metrics that they're comfortable with. And if you're still gonna add value to that, that'd be great, but it's a lot more challenging now. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it's also, to Greg's point, it's the market you're buying in too, right? Like the Denver metro area has seen a lot of appreciation um, over the last 10 years. And so, yes, you're trying to buy cash flow, but there's more of a story there to, to you know, being worth buying it here, renovating here and being worth here. Um, and in some of these markets, because because we know plenty of guys that, that play in some of these two share markets, you know, they're they're buying higher cap rates and they're buying cash on cash returns. And obviously the hope is that it also appreciates, but, um, and if you hold on to it long enough, obviously it should, but they're not looking to buy something for 50 a door and sell it for a hundred a door in two years. It's not, it's just not the strategy. Um, so I think it's all, all about the market you're looking in and, and, and what you're looking at um, Definitely. For, for the next 10 years. So um, we are shortly running out of time. Um, just do a little closing thought question. Um, will we see uh, distress like we saw in 09, 2010 over the next 12 months? Greg. I don't, I don't think so. I think there's too many factors fighting against it, uh, namely these massive stimuluses. Uh, I, I have to think that there's going to be another one passed, and I said it earlier, but especially because we're heading into an election. And so I don't see there being that much distress in the market. I also think that the lenders have been much more responsible this go around. I think that there will be increased levels, but I'm not holding out for huge discounts. Ed? I, I think there's too much equity on the sidelines to let that happen in the next year. You know, my greatest fear is, is rising interest rates and you, you say because of inflation and then therefore your rents should increase too. But um, I just think there's so much liquidity out there and especially in the apartment world, if, if there was, you know, money put aside to go into retail and office and people are kind of scared of those, um, of, the, of, the, of those sandboxes to go play and I think they're going to move to multifamily and just create more demand um, where, you know, it's good when you're owning stuff already, you got some protection there, but I think it's going to be a lot more challenging trying to buy uh, in the next year, even if there is a slight dip, because I think there's be way more money chasing those deals. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with both of you. And I think that when we get those phone calls about, you know, we want a discount, we want to stress. I mean, I think the difference in between, you know, this versus 09, 2010 is there's a lot of people with big war chests ready to go. Um, and some, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in liquidity uh, ready to pounce. If, you know, but I think it's um, whether that's uh, private individuals, whether that's companies that have just built up a war chest through this cycle that we're waiting for some distress, but you know, is, is there going to be a little distress? I'm sure there'll be a little bit, but I don't think we're going to see this like wide, you know, market wide distress. Um, and then when something is a little distressed, I think there's going to be a ton of people that have that type of money ready to go after it. So it may not even end up trading for a quote unquote, a distress, really, really distressed price because there's going to be too many people trying to chase it. Um, so um, but something Greg brought up earlier, I think with all the liquidity in the market, I, you know, we could even see cap rate compression with, with debt where it's at and so much liquidity and people flipping from retail and office to, to multifamily. So but it's, uh, it's an interesting time in the market and um, hopefully it will continue to be strong. But anyway, that's all we have for today. Thank you guys both for joining us again. And um, let us know if anybody has any questions offline, always available. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having Thanks us. For having